Hey folks, this is Matt once again, and this time Steven Seagal is under siege. The film that really put him in the big time, because his previous films had all, they've all been hits. From Above the Law to Out for Justice, they were all commercial hits. One he did for Fox, March for Death, the other for Warner Brothers. So because of those hits that kept climbing, like I said before, and the reviews for those movies, Hard to Kill, March for Death, they made over $40 million dollars. That's definitely more than the movies that, say, Van Damme's films were making. So, okay, this guy's climbing. Let's give him a big movie. And let's reteam him with the director who directed his first film, Above the Law, Andrew Davis. And Andrew Davis, a year later, after this, would do The Fugitive. And the rumor, at least on one of the trivia, is that Harrison Ford saw this movie. And that's what made him go, okay, I'll trust this Andrew Davis guy and do The Fugitive. I don't know if that's true, but... I like to think so. Does that think, well, actually, no. I'm trying to think. I think on the Fugitive DVD, it won those flipper discs. I think Harrison Ford says that. On I can't remember. I haven't seen that in forever. I swear there's a new featurette on there, and Harrison Ford mentions it. I could be wrong, though. But that's what it mentions on the trivia on IMDb. Either way, if Harrison Ford thinks that, I agree. This is a really well done flick. This film made over 80 million in the US and it made a shitload of money worldwide. And people thought, okay, he's been making box office hits. Now he's arrived into the A level of Schwarzenegger and Stallone. Then he did On Deadly Ground after this and it went to the shitter. But. I said before, Andrew Davis, I like him as a director from Above the Law, Code of Silence before that, The Fugitive after this, Collateral Damage I Enjoy, Chain Reaction was uh, alright. Michael Wilmington at LA Times says it best, Die Hard on a Battleship. High tech thriller with laughs and thrills. Yeah. And you have great villains, Gary Busey and Tommy Lee Jones. That's a great combination right there. That's a hell of a combination. Gary Chain did a good job on the music. I believe he did the score to Death Warrant with Van Damme. I could be wrong, but I believe that was Gary Chain. But yeah, I could be wrong. And the plot is actually for pretty simple. It takes place on the USS Missouri at a real-life battleship they got. That really helped with the film. The fact that they use real a real battleship. This was on a real battleship and that's a cool setting for Flick because it's not every day that happens and they had the money to film it on there. And it didn't look cheap and fake and low budget and like it cost five bucks. This was like a big movie. And again that's a cool place to set your movie at. And it's about ready to be decommissioned in California so it's being taking on its final trip, its final voyage, and the captain's ready to have a surprise birthday party. Casey Ryback, Steven Seagal's character doesn't like that, he's the cook. And Gary Busey doesn't like him, but even the captain mentions, oh, he's more than a cook, you, you just let him be. XO, and the XO is Gary Busey, who we find out is a turnco, and is inviting these guys for the party who are bad guys. Gonna take over the battleship, kill the captain, get a bunch of the crew and get them trapped in certain areas. And they want to have this submarine that's with the bad guys have a submarine, unload these missiles to sell them, as well as fuck up some shit and make a lot of money. But they didn't expect on the cook. I'm just so lowly. Lowly cook. You also have Erica Alaniac and her great talents on her chest that I want to rub in my face. And it's one of those films that when you think of 90s action movies, that's one of the movies that come up under siege. And I would say it's I was wondering if Above the Law, but no, Under Siege is Seagal's most popular film. I mean, it's his biggest says his most popular movie. I think for the most part, well, not all, but a lot of people think of Steven Seagal, they think of Under Siege. My favorite is Out for Justice, but... 
this has a lot of stuff going for it. Like I said, it looks like they had a budget for it. It was used very well. Andrew Davis did a really good job directing it. I do find it ironic that in an early scene, Steven Seagal is with his crewmen in the kitchen and they're listening to, I've got the power. I'm like, you still have a Jeff Speedman from The Perfect Weapon. No, not really, but I mean, a year before, that was in The, the Perfect Weapon of Jeff Speedman, that song. What the fuck? In 1991, or was that 90? That was 90, not 91. No, no. I keep mixing, I keep mixing that up, whether it's 90 or 91. But man, I, yeah, 91. But there's some fun dialogue. A guy who's an asshole is fucked with Casey, saying you should be out of here. You gotta get ready for the party. And Casey Ryback's like, no, sir, I don't like surprises. The captain doesn't like surprises. I cook for the captain. And has some fun back and forth dialogue where he goes, well, I guess that means I won't get to see you go through puberty. <laughs> or when Derek Busey comes in and spits in the soup, he pr he pushes Derek Busey. Oh, that's striking an officer. And so goes like, that's not striking an officer. And then punches Terry Busey, that struck that struck in an officer. I, he gets put into the meat locker to be held there until after the party. And Tyler Lee Jones is a lot of fun, as well as Terry Busey. They're a big reason why this film works. They're two great villains with a lot of personality, a lot of energy, a lot of fun. Tyler Lee Jones, he's got like crosses, he's got a tie-dye shirt, black jacket, headband. He's having the fun of his life and throughout the film he's mentioning cartoons like he's the roadrunner and Derek Busey's like you're the roadrunner and Tommy Lee Jones goes yeah never been caught beep beep <laughs> and later on references cartoons about the sea creatures that had two little pistols and they were going up against you know a cook because because Later on, they're going to fuck with the cook, and the cook is going to fuck back and bake some asses to kick off into a fucking field goal. And you have this little dipshit guarding it, and Seagal's like giving him shit, and they tell him, Go get my pies out of the oven! You got shit for brains! Now go get my pies out of the oven! And, of course, the party begins, surprise party. Erica Laniac is there because she's going to jump out of the cake. And you find out later on that she took some pills and she was knocked out and she wakes up again. Thinking there's a party, you see her titties, but I believe she was a Playboy Playmate and then she was on the TV show Baywatch as well. And she does fine for what she has to do. She's not given much to do, but titties which look great and... She did fun again, she did fun for what the script told her to do. But yeah, everything goes haywire during the party. Tamley Jones shoots the highest ranking officer and calls the people a bunch of wussies. Uh, these some go after Derry Busey sends Well, Derry Busey goes to send more, but Tamley Jones goes, No, I send two. I mean, you know, these guys are trained professionals. They can you know, kill a hundred cooks and they'll be fine. But they don't know they're messing with Steven fucking Seagal as he is at this time. Later on, he'd just be Steven fat fuck Seagal. But here is Steven fucking Seagal. Where the two going after Seagal, they kill the guard who's outside the meat locker. But Seagal's hiding and he throws one knife into a guy's neck. He overpowers the other and fucks him up. And he puts a bomb in the microwave, makes a bomb for later usage when people go by there. And I'll jump ahead, people go by, play Timely Jones, Gary Busey, and it blows up and some debris hits a guy in the face and falls down dead. And that's where Timely Jones goes, okay, that and how this guy got knifed in the neck, you know, this is a work of professional. 
Well, there's one thing that I'm a bit confused about, which I'll, I'll mention at the end of the flick. At the end of the review, I should say. But... The bad guys, they seem to know, for the most part, what they're doing. The fight, There's fighter planes around them, they shoot them down. They got some fun Jimi Hendrix music playing. New, 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 new. Chop it down for the better my hand. And then they do this fun thing where they call the military, the Pentagon, and Tom Lee Jones is making him sound like he's a crazy nut. And you see that Gary Busey and the guy. I forget the guy's name. He was on Star Trek The Next Generation. And he's been in other stuff as well. I'll recognize his name when I see it. I'll look it up. But they're both sort of laughing quietly as Tom Lee Jones is going nuts about how he wants to bring the 60s back and how he wants to just make him crazy. Then at the end, even Derek Bees is going, Do they buy it? Who cares? <laughs> it's that sort of thing. Or, yeah, they probably think I'm just nuts and that's it. I thought that was kind of nice that you have the bad guys have fun and they're not just let's do this and let's kill them all and very one note very no personality Gary Busey and Henry Jones have a lot of personality to them and the other guy I was thinking is is Gary Busey and Cole Meany who is in such the next generation as Miles O'Brien he's also the guy in Con Air Sort of the asshole messing with John Cusack, whose car gets taken on the Con Air airplane and then gets dropped in front of him. <laughs> That's Cole Meany. He's one of the bad guys as well. And he does fine in the flag. I like him. And Tommy Lee Jones ends it by, Welcome to the Revolution. And like I said, they think they think they believe you? Yeah, probably. And then they blow up the satellite relay so they don't get any onlookers. And that's where Sigal finds Eric Laniac in her great scrumptious days from a birthday cake. And gets her and asks her questions. She doesn't know what's going on. And he's like, I'm just a cook. Just a lowly, lowly cook. And she's thinking they're going to die. And that's where it comes back to the... That's the thing. Okay. In this film, you have someone added it up. It's an hour and 40 minutes, and you get about 40 minutes of Steven Seagal. So it's an hour and 40 minute movie, 40 minutes of Steven Seagal. That means the other hour is either stuff with the Pentagon, which I will miss the least interesting. It's just there for give us the audience info, or with the villains. But the villains have such great personalities that we deal with Steven Seagal, who is a badass, cool character, Casey Ryback, or Eric who's very pretty, or it cuts to some fun villains with some great personalities. If you don't do that back and forth, it's like Die Hard, where you have Bruce Willis, then you have a great villain like Alan Griffin, but then when you go outside, at least... They have Sergeant Al Powell, who has an interesting backstory about how he shot a kid, but also some little quirky things, like he knows all the ingredient, ingredients of a, of a Twinkie. Like, I would say if there's any nitpicks, which didn't bother me, but it's but that's why it's called nitpicks. If I can stop stuttering, that's why it's called nitpicks. When you go to the Pentagon, it's just there to give us info that I really don't give a shit about. That I think it's info. I don't think you need to leave and go back to the Pentagon. It all could have just stayed on the battleship. And it could have just been info, uh, info that hey, blah 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 blah, and that's it. You really didn't need anything else. You, but uh, I mean, that's a nitpick. I'm just saying the people in the Pentagon were not the most, they were not interesting characters. And it's just, okay, going back there just to give us info, but there's another word I'm thinking of. 
God, there's a certain term I'm thinking of when it's a scene's exposition. That's, they're just used for exposition. And, of course, exposition, since I've seen this film so many times, I know what's going on. Those, those are usually the scenes I fast forward through. I'm like, I know what's going on with the plot. I'll fast forward. Let me do about these themes at all. Or Dear Busey and Timely Jones. But again, that's not a big problem for me. That's a nitpick. And the fight scenes when they happen are fun. Gives a chop to a guy's neck. He able to talk to control room until about, you know, they're building some stuff to offload the missile somewhere. And that's where you get another scene with Dear Busey where Tamerly Jones asks, what are you going to do with $200 million? And Busey goes, I'm going to buy the presidency. But Seagal sets up this rid to fuck up the bad guy's helicopter. And... There's one scene in the trailer that is cut out that I wonder where it would have been. And if you see the trailer, there's a line that Tom Lee Jones goes, See you in hell, sailor boy. That's nowhere in the movie. I don't know where that would have been in the film. I wonder if it would have been during or after this sequence where he's setting this helicopter up and the fuel line. And that's where you get the scene where he sort of does his diehard moment. When Bruce Willis jumps off the building here, he has a rope and jumps off the ship to hang off the side and the helicopter blows up. Good practical stuff, stuff done for real, good explosions. Stuntmen did a good job because that's some dangerous shit to do. Have a helicopter blow up behind you and have to jump off and hang off the side of a battleship. It's not an easy thing to do. So he has some really good set pieces. Shoot some motherfuckers in the head who have Eric Elaniac. In fact, one of them is Kane Hodder. When the bad guys have Eric Elaniac after he's blown up the helicopter and he's climbed back up, there's a guy he grabs and he shoots from the back. It goes up the front. The bullet goes through the front. The guy he grabs and shoots from the back. That's Kane Hodder. I'm like, oh shit, there's Jason Voorhees. Steve Zagor just killed Jason Voorhees. Holy shit. And you know, shoots some fuckers in the head and sets up this grenade at the door. And bad guys get there and Timely Jones tries to warn them. But the door gets blown back and fucks up some more guys. See if girls try and get some more info out there. Find out what to do next. And then he hears some noise from a door and it's Morse code. And she's asking, what is it? And he goes, they're saying, get me the fuck out of here. So I think there's some fun lines of dialogue in this as well. And Gary Busey is wondering, how can we get Casey Rabat to come for us? I'll start flooding the crew members and he'll try to rescue them. Um, but most of them, so go rescues a handful of people, gives them guns, and they try to rescue the hostages. You have this fun shootout in a hallway. Gets to a moment where he's a bass, gets two submachine guns, doo -doo 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 -doo, and holds it like a cross. So he shoots one to this guy here, and if a guy goes over here, he shoots it. And he'll do da -da 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 -da, going through the hallways on the side. Bah, 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 bah. See, if it wasn't for copyright, this is where I would show footage instead of me going, bah, 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 bah. but <laughs> I don't know. You see, either you've seen the film. Or if you haven't seen the film, see it for yourself instead of me going ba 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 and him doing da da ba 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 ba. <laughs> but the action scenes work for what they have to do, and they're well staged, they're well shot, they're shot in wide shots. It's not quick cuts. It's not confusing editing. Yes, some nice little bits of blood, bloody. I'm not going so far call it gore, but some bloody moments. Like there's a piece of beam, and there's a bad guy, and Seagal lets it loose, and it falls on a guy. You see from the ground where it impaled the guy, and see a group of blood fall down. That was a nice moment. You have a chop shop type 
area where he fucks up some guys. He gets a knife and hits one in the neck and hits another guy in the armpit, which I that's not a that's not a place you see a lot of times get hit. But ooh, the armpit! You just imagine how that would feel right there in the armpit. I love the moment where he pushes a guy into the saw blade and cuts into his shoulder. I, I always enjoyed that moment. But then the bad guys get some stuff in because the Navy SEALs are coming and the bad guys fuck them up. Some of them have bazookas on their little sub and they kill the, the SEALs so their help isn't coming. But it's like this back and forth. As soon as the good guys get something, then the bad guys do something. It's this sort of back and forth. Oh, now you got to go pissed because you killed the Navy SEAL team. Now him and his buddies are going to do some shit. We're going to get rid of that fucking sub that you guys have. Kiss my ass. We're going to sink your fucking battleship down to my fucking nuts so you can lick them. So he's going to get these guys. He's going to get these big old... I don't know what you call them. These big guns. They're attached to the ship. <coughs> Sets him up, and at one point he tries to mess with the sub and blow it up, but he gets found out and barely gets away. And Eric Alaniac actually saves him by shooting Cole Meany. And then after that, he's him and the crew of people he rescued set up these big guns, fuck up Gary Busey and his the submarine he's in, which. What I did to Under Siege 2 and the plan that John Peters was going to produce it and he wanted Gary Busey back as the villain. Yeah, I'll have a lot more confusion as to what the fuck John Peters was smoking. Maybe he's too busy trying to get into fist fights or something or he's too busy worrying about the streets, John Peters. Or maybe he's too fucking busy worrying about a fucking giant spider in the third act of a movie. To know what the fuck's going on in films like Under Siege 1, you don't produce Under Siege 2. And for those who don't get that, that's the guy who was going to direct, who was going to produce the Tim Burton Superman Lives movie with the giant spire in the third act. And then we're going to direct, not direct, but produce Wild Wild West, which did have a giant spire in the third act. So it shows how the guy's a little bit cool, cool. But I. I should say that for Under Siege 2, which I like Under Siege 2. Between the two, I would say I like Under Siege 1 more, just because I like the villains in Under Siege 2, but the villains in this are just much more of a personality and just much more of a presence. And the battleship has a little bit of claustrophobic setting in the bowels of the ship, which I like, and... I like Morse Chestnut in Under Siege 2, but Sergo's sidekick is Eric Alania with two luscious titties, so I gotta pick the two luscious titties over Morris Chestnut. Sorry, Morris. The two scrumptious titties win. But, getting back to this, after Tony Lee Jones finds out that the sub's been blown up, he goes a little bit cuckoo crazy. And that's what he mentions about. you know, cartoons and tells him they get the hell out and launches his missile to Honolulu and Tony Jones really did a great job with this. Just this little pity. Oh mama. Oh mama. We 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 all the way home Happy Trails. <laughs> He's a great villain. I mean, someone said at best, you need, if you don't have a great hero, you gotta have a great villain. And having both Timely Jones and Gary Busey, pretty damn fucking good villains. And then, yeah, the store worked well, Gary Chain. I know I said this before, but I believe he did the store to Death Warrant with Van Damme. I could be wrong. I like that store. This store fit well with the flick. Seagull and them are trying to get to stop the missile. Seagull rips a dice, throw it out. Gets face to face with Tom Lee Jones. And Seagull goes, I know you, don't I? 
And then Tommy Lee Jones goes, yeah, it's been a while. And that's the thing that confuses me, because earlier he heard the name Casey Ryback. I don't think he can... He seems to know this guy pretty well. Why didn't the name ring a bell for Tommy Lee Jones earlier on? Like, he's like... Casey Radbeck, I want to see what this personnel is. I want to see what this guy's about. Oh, this guy isn't just a cook. I don't think he didn't, why didn't he, he didn't remember, I guess, what Steven Seagal's character looked like. But again, he seemed like he knew him very, very well. I'm like, I haven't talked to people in a long time, but if... I, if I heard their name, I would recognize what the hell their face was. And again, that's a nitpick, but it's like, wait a minute, they, they know each other? I thought that kind of came a little bit out of left field, that they knew each other. Because again, Tommy Lee Jones never played as if he recognized the name. He's just, who is this guy, blah, blah, blah. So again, I don't know if that was written at the last minute. I don't know if some stuff was cut out. But again, that seemed a little bit out. Just it's just a nip, a little bit out of left field. But the actors play it off well enough that I can get by it. It's just something I know. I was like, wait a minute, how? Did I, huh? And then at the end of knife fight, of course, Steven Seagal is going to be very one-sided and win very easily. I think it's like a little knife by the eyebrow, and just like films a la March for Death. When he kills a villain, he'll kill him fucking viciously. In March for Death, one villain, he'll put his sword at your crotch and cut your head off. The other villain, he'll gouge your eyeballs, both of them out, break your back, and throw you down a fucking elevator to be impaled. Here, he's going to get a thumb into the eye and gouge one of Tommy Lee Jones' eyeballs. Then he's going to put a knife through the head. And then to top it off, he's going to throw him right into a fucking computer screen. <laughs> so... I love it. I'm laughing because I love that. I mean, I wish more heroes were that brutal to their villains. That's part of that's one of the reasons that's this early Steven Seagal is fun is that at times he almost gets a little Jason Voorhees when he's dispatching his villains. <laughs> I think that's a lot of fun. He doesn't do that every movie, but when he does, it it's, brings a little bit of joy to my heart in a weird, crazy way. But they stop the missile, they save the day, he kisses Eric Elania, she probably sits on his face, and then we get to the sequel. But Under Siege 2, uh, Under Siege 2, Under Siege 2 Dark Territory I do like, which I'll talk about, not next, because the film that came out after this was on Daily Ground, so I'll review that next. But Under, Under Siege 2 is a good sequel. But yeah, of the Die Hard and uh, movies is definitely one of the better ones that a lot of people mention, and for good reason. I don't repeat myself, but Andrew Davis did a good job directing. Steven Seagal, this was his most popular flick. Great location for the battleship. Nice that they use an actual battleship. Did a great job with the, the look. Just the fact it didn't look like it was cheap. It didn't look like it was cheap Jack Horse shit. It looked like it looked for real because a lot of it was real. When the fight scenes and action scenes were there, they were well done. The the idea is cool. The directing, very spirited, personality filled villains, the strong, silent, capable hero. And two lovely scrumptious titties of Eric Alaniac. I mean, any red-blooded American sure like Under Siege. Again, the only problem is I have a little nitpicks. Like, did Tom Lee Jones knew Steven Seagal, but that came out of left field almost at the end? And why didn't he recognize it earlier? And also, when they go back to the Pentagon, those characters are not interested at all. So I, I just fast-forward through the Pentagon stuff to get to Seagal and Tom Lee Jones. Back on the battleship. You know, if I... I think it would have been fine if just wanted to... Re at least 95% on the battleship. And maybe, like, two minutes tops going... Two, three minutes tops going to the Pentagon. That's just my opinion. 
But again, those are just little nitpicks. This is still a pretty damn good movie. Very solid film. One of Steven Seagal's best. Uh, I would put it in the top five Seagal films. Uh, I definitely would. Uh, Under Siege is a damn good flick. And it's sad Warner Brothers are assholes and don't want to deal with Steven Seagal because of all the Seagal films that deserve a special edition, this would be a no-brainer. I mean, at least talk to Andrew Davis. Talk to Tom Lee Jones. Because this helped work with Andrew Davis to get to fucking Fugitive, which he won an Oscar. Talk to Gary Busey. Talk to Eric Laniac. If you don't want to deal with Seagal, okay. But what do I know? Either way, thanks for watching, take care, and we'll see you later. Bye-bye.